To Dubliners at least, Nat Talbot's life is familiar in broad outline. He was born into the Dublin of the 1850s, famine poor and hungry Dublin, in which 5,000 a year were dying of cholera. His birthplace in Alborough Court was virtually wiped out when a German plane bombed the North Strand in 1941. But all his life, Nat Talbot was to live in this same area of North Dublin. His parents flitted from house to house a dozen times, always to tenements or small cottages. And Nat Talbot was to find work on the north side of the city too, after the most elementary schooling with the Christian Brothers in North Richmond Street. The only mark he left there is to be seen on the roll books. Nat Talbot, a Mitcher. The North Strand area of those days was far from pleasant. The aftermath of the Crimean War had filled Dublin barracks up with undischarged soldiers, and pubs, brothels and she-beans stood cheek by jowl with rotten dwellings. It was common enough for youngsters to drink porter, and Nat Talbot, aged 12, got a job which made drinking easier. As a messenger in Ian J. Burke's bottling store in North Lots, he was able to sample Guinness to his heart's content. And from there, he came here to the Dublin Port and Docks Board bonded warehouse on the north wall where his father worked. Now, by the time he was 20, Nat Talbot was a well-known boozer in this area, as indeed were most of his family, including the father. And if he learned to drink stout in Ian J. Burke's, it was in here that he learned to drink whiskey. What he couldn't get free here on the job He'd spend all his money on outside. In fact, his sister had said of him that he'd sell his boots and his shirt to get money for drink. And of course, he drank on tick in a dozen pubs around this area. In fact, after his conversion, he spent many years paying off the debts at a few shillings a week to those same public houses. From the Port and Docks board, he went to a builder's labourer with a firm called Pemberton's. And it was while he was working for them at the age of 27 or 28 that he suddenly gave up drink. He and his brother Phil, another notorious drinker, were on slack time. They decided to hang around this corner at Newcomen Bridge in the North Strand to watch the men on full time coming home, in the hope that some of them would buy the brothers a drink. But all the men passed them by, folk memory has it, because they knew that the Talbots wouldn't be able to stand there round. Nat Talbot went home and told his mother he was going to take the pledge. And it's at this point that the legend of Nat Talbot really begins. Not only did he take the pledge here at Clonmouth College, but he was to keep it for the rest of his life. And from being a drunkard, possibly an alcoholic, he turned suddenly, almost dramatically, to religious observances of an extreme kind. Mary Purcell has written the authoritative biography of the man. What happened, do you think, on the day that Nat Talbot decided he was going to give up drink? It seemed a very sudden decision. Yes, especially as the children were standing there, Matt and Joe, himself and his brother. I think he must have got, first of all, disgusted with the men that passed him by. Because he was rather generous, I think, at all times of his life and he probably had treated them when he had money. And then I think he got a sudden flash, a look at his own life, that he was working for drink, that he was doing all these spare time jobs to get money for drink, and that his whole life was just one soak. You've spoken, as you say, to those who knew him. What did they think? What did they say to you? Well, the old man who knew him in his drinking days, uh, Pat Dyle, um, he used to think Matt, as a, in his younger days, when he was drinking, a bit of a coward, he said, that he wouldn't um, um, wrestle with the other boys, he wouldn't play cards, he wouldn't twist the rope for the girls skipping, he wouldn't go in swimming. And I said, Pat, what did you think? Ma, a bit of a granny in those days, he said. But he certainly showed a lot of courage afterwards because plenty of people must have jeered at him for his 
despised practices. Yes, I wondered about that. What, what did some of these people know? Of course, many of them long dead. Did they think he was a bit of a, a religious fanatic, do you think? Uh, no, I can't say that anyone seemed to think that. And that's brought out very clearly by Rafe O'Callaghan's evidence and by Dr. Moore, the heart specialist in the matter. Uh, both of these men thought, when Matt Kiam came to them first, that he might be a, a bit off, an oddball. And uh, Rafe Callaghan definitely says, I drew him out carefully just to make sure he wasn't eccentric. And Dr. Moore, the same. They both thought that he was quite they, sane, obviously. Not only sane, but they, Dr. Moore thought him a very ordinary.